Night Dive Studios has had a pretty fantastic 2024. After kicking off the year by re-releasing Dark Forces and then sliding into obscure FPS titles with PO Definitive Edition, they finally rounded things off with a surprise remaster of Doom 1 and 2. October, though, brings us to Night Dive's latest sprucing up of an overlooked and practically forgotten FPS gem, Killing Time Resurrected. I won't pretend to know anything about this game as I basically knew nothing of the games released on the 3DO until a few years back. The console was not even on my radar as a kid, and in the years since, it has become practically impossible to play any of those games outside of emulation. That's what makes Killing Time Resurrected such an enticing prospect. Not only is this another 3DO game finally getting exposed to a wider audience, it's another opportunity for Night Dive to put out into the world a definitive version of a zany and often polarizing title. Everybody loves quote-unquote good games, but what about the experimental, non-mainstream ones that were never given the proper respect they deserved simply because they bucked conventions of the day? Unlike with P.O.'d, where I begrudgingly accepted that the remaster was high quality while the game was not, Killing Time is actually quite shockingly good. If you didn't tell me this was a remaster, I would honestly believe it was some indie Metroidvania shooter that was attempting to recreate the 90s experience. Not everything works here, through no fault of Night Dive's remastering efforts, but Killing Time Resurrected has enough tweaks to smooth over some rough edges and make this particular release a must play. The plot isn't truly important in Killing Time, and while I am fond of the way the story is told, you don't really need to pay attention beyond the first couple of dialogue sequences. The story unfolds in the early 1930s on the mysterious Mantenicus Island. You assume the role of an unnamed student of Egyptology who stumbles upon the estate of the wealthy heiress Tess Conway. After finding some artifacts and attempting to conduct a ritual of eternal life, something goes awry and it casts a dastardly curse on Miss Conway spreading her body parts across the island. It also turns all of her friends and employees into strange monsters. You are now tasked with recovering the pieces of Tess's body, while also working towards destroying a mystical Egyptian water clock to send all of the supernatural forces back to hell where they belong. None of that is exceptionally original, but where Killing Time stands above its contemporaries is with regards to how it pulls the story off. In the remaster, the only traditional cutscenes come up in the form of the intro cinematic and one at the very end. Everything else plays out when you stumble upon ghostly appearances and listen to their plates. You'll find these by closing in on a voice saying, help me, and then waiting for a moment. The first few give you essential beats of the plot that will set your exploration in motion, whereas everything else is mostly flavor text and lore that details what happened on the island and to its inhabitants. The cutscenes are all FMVs with real-time actors, giving Killing Time a suitably 90s vibe. Much like some of the best recent open world games, none of this is mandatory. You'll likely be enticed because of how well Night Dive has upscaled everything, making the FMVs look and sound as if they were brand new, but you can safely ignore all of this and simply work your way across the island looking for the vessels that contain Tess's body parts. That's where the meat and potatoes of Killing Time kicks in, its exploration. In a fashion similar to something like System Shock or even Strife, Killing Time takes place in one location that is divided up into segments. The main attraction is the giant Conway estate, which houses not only the living quarters of the island's inhabitants, but other rooms hiding goodies and monsters galore. When you first get there, you won't be allowed in without an RSVP, and your next objective becomes clear. You'll need to find that invitation. You can go wherever you like, though obviously items you need are in a specific location. You can find some stuff early, however, and it helps speed up the process. The organic way in which Killing Time doles out these objectives feels very modern, never stopping to beat the player over the head with what is next, or preventing them from going somewhere, within reason. That also extends to the exploration, which doesn't work like traditional games of its day. In what was likely mind-blowing in 1995, Killing Time's map doesn't feature loading screens between different areas. You'll absolutely be funneled down narrow paths that mask transitions, and this remaster does have small pauses when played at high frame rates, but the game fakes seamlessness by using clever geometry to trick the player into thinking they're in the same area. I suppose this remaster could have gone the full mile and simply recreated the map with no stopping points, but despite not doing that, the gimmick still works. You never have to wait when exploring and it keeps you constantly engaged. Where this maybe backfires a little is that Mantinicus Island can sort of be devoid of landmarks, and it often has long stretches of land that contain literally nothing. 
Monsters in Killing Time also do not respawn when killed. So when you're backtracking to collect parts of Tess Conway's body, you'll often find yourself just wandering. I'm not exactly sure how fast travel would even work here, but it's simply not an option. Different buildings often have level design that loops back on itself, and sometimes there's even alternate routes, so you shouldn't find yourself too lost. It could still happen, however, and that isn't helped by how keys are identified. I'd like to state that this remaster at least makes an incredible change in that when you pick up an item, a message will play at the top of the screen indicating what it is. This includes guns, the pieces of Tess's body, which are called vessels, and keys. In the original game and its PC port, none of these messages appeared and keys were not given titles. In Killing Time Resurrected, keys are titled by their color, much like a classic boomer shooter. But almost nothing about Killing Time's design is relatable to a boomer shooter. While having a yellow key would obviously mean you can open yellow doors, the keys in Killing Time open specific doors in certain sections of the map. I don't recall which color does what, but towards the halfway point, I forgot where I would need to use the purple key because nothing in the game is named Purple Room. It also doesn't help that you'll then find the green key and the yellow green key, exacerbating problems. I think it would be wise to rename these keys to the areas they unlock, such as calling one the wine cellar key and so on. With all of that complaining out of the way, I don't have much else negative to say about Killing Time. Maybe the music is goofy as hell, but there is also a certain charm to how non-traditional it is. You'll round a corner to a ragtime tune, then exit a passageway into something more melancholic. That mishmash mentality extends to the enemies, which are a truly bizarre collection of spirits, monsters, and children's entertainers. This might be the aspect I enjoyed the most with Killing Time, but its enemy roster is wildly diverse. I don't think anyone can ever say no to shooting a clown, but that you'll simultaneously be shooting clowns while gunning down possessed maids and blasting floating demon heads is the kind of ridiculousness I enjoy. Everything about Killing Time screams B-movie charm, and it's fantastic. Battling the foes will see you utilizing some neat weapons as well, though combat never feels like it is the main focus. It's more perfunctory than anything, even if the weapon feedback is good. Killing Time contains an arsenal of eight weapons, though two of those are melee weapons that you may never actually use. You have access to a knife, a crowbar, a revolver, which can eventually be dual wielded, a shotgun, a tommy gun, a ridiculously amazing flamethrower, some molotovs, and a BFG-like staff called the Ankh of Ramses. Those first three weapons are fine, but they mainly exist to tide you over until you grab something else. The shotgun, though, is ludicrously overpowered and will probably become your default weapon of choice here. That's not to say the flamethrower is bad, as it's perhaps the best overall weapon. It acts more like a rocket launcher, spraying out balls of flame that then travel in a straight line and shoot out in bursts. It can topple pretty much everyone and is great for clearing rooms with ease. Killing Time Resurrected does rebalance these weapons, and I'm not familiar enough with the original game to tell you the difference. You can toggle this rebalance on or off, but I opted to keep everything in its default state for this review. As such, the Tommy Gun weirdly feels kind of inept. It shoots in bursts and manages to stun lock foes, but it seemingly lacks stopping power. It takes a surprising amount of ammo to down anything, especially considering the shotgun can sometimes one-shot enemies. The Ankh, meanwhile, is your screen clearer when too much is going on. One shot will obliterate everything in sight, so the weapon is limited to five shots at any one time. It's clearly fantastic, but not something you'll be using more than a handful of opportunities. And that's really all you need to know about Killing Time before jumping in. Getting into specifics would require me to skim over all my recorded footage, but I enjoyed how all of the puzzles in this game are based on context-sensitive clues. When traversing the wine cellar, for instance, you'll need to be on the lookout for specific kegs as those will clue you into which ones need to be pressed. The very helpful auto map will also identify targets with yellow lines once you've spotted them, so that's a huge plus that this remaster brings. Sequences where you have to pull levers won't leave you in the dark, as some brilliant sound design helps clue you into what has just opened. Even the design of certain areas works with a carrot on a stick approach, where you'll get sucked in by spotting a vessel, only for you to then have to work out how to access it. It's incredibly good stuff. That same praise also has to go to this remaster, which shows Night Dive Studios in top form, as usual. The textures and character sprites have been beautifully upscaled, and the redrawn HUD looks immaculate. Some of the weapon sprites show weird outlines, but at least animate smoothly. The performance is flawless on PC, despite loading hiccups between areas, 
and the audio quality is very stellar. Night Dive has even included originally cut content in the form of new areas, though those mostly amount to single rooms where you'll kill enemies and then collect a new vessel. Similar to the recent Doom remaster, Killing Time Resurrected also features a vault and has a ton of unearthed documents about this game's development. You have access to all of the original sprite data, Night Dive's new sprites, every cinematic in the game, all the audio tracks, and early concept art. It's exactly the type of stuff I love seeing in remasters, as it doesn't attempt to paint over history by ignoring the rougher parts of it. It's also just plain cool to hear unused audio without having to resort to digging through a game's directory. There's probably some stuff I'm missing with this review, but the sentiment should be clear. Killing Time Resurrected is a wonderful remaster of an overlooked game that modernizes it just enough to make it feel completely fresh again. As I was traversing Mintinicus Island, I found myself reminiscing about the days when developers didn't yet have a blueprint for how an FPS game should be made. I missed the time when smallish teams could get together and try to explore the confines of their chosen genre instead of needing to rigidly adhere to conventional wisdom. I also really enjoy when games give players the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, and don't try to stop them from screwing up or getting lost. That sort of trust in the player is what got me into gaming many years ago. All of this isn't to say that Killing Time Resurrected will be a game for everyone. It's very clearly not that. The game is goofy and off-kilter, with its appeal resting in how non-conformist it is. If you find yourself tired with the average massive blockbuster and its strict linearity, however, you might just find your antidote here. At the very least, this is worth a shot just to understand the historical value of what this 3DO title held.